Welcome back, everyone, to Arsenal Pass, episode 33. Arsenal Pass, time of the round, that is. I'm joined here by Tim Bunn. You might recognize him as the man who triple sigiled me on camera. Funny thing, I actually haven't played on camera since then, and some people speculate it's out of pure shame. I can uh, reasonably understand that. It was a pretty crazy moment. Yeah, I mean, I probably should have seen it coming. Um, most decks, you know, got the... Yeah, three damage out of the defense reaction, embarrassment, you know, take the win, the clutches of my hands, um, nah, but it was all good. If you'd uh, listened between rounds, I would have told you I had three sigils. <laughs> I, specifically remem- I specifically remember everybody saying what was in their deck, and Tim just be like, yeah, my deck's good. <laughs> Not giving me the spice. All right, Tim. Um, yeah, so Tim is probably one of my favorite human beings in the world at this point. Um, I met him a while ago actually at a uh a road to nationals so i think i don't know if we read in the we didn't I don't, we didn't mean the texas one but in the edmund unplugged road to nationals i played tim in the quarterfinals round um tim was undefeated at that point i had squeaked in at eight and hmm, when the camera's off you know how that goes duh, don't you tim you play a lot better that's for sure <laughs> yeah i don't get triple sigiled yeah play really <laughs> yeah so we met the place. Um, yeah, you're actually on Agrokatsu, which wasn't too popular back then, although I do think the, the deck was very good. Um, bit unfortunate that you ran into me in the, in the quarters, because if you hadn't, I think that you had some pretty easy matchups going into the semis yeah. and the finals, so probably would have been I a agree. W. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. It's funny, um, so your brother, Zach, um, Zach Bunn from Team Covenant was also there. Um, ended up losing in the other quarter, so they were both. They both actually placed. They were high seeds going into that top eight at Edmund Unplugged. Needed their road to nationals invite, and both lost in the quarterfinals. That must yeah, have been Zach's a... road to the finals was going to be a lot harder though, because he had to, right. would have to face two prisms, I think, as Bravo. Mm-hmm. Not a good time. Tell me about that car ride back. Was it uh, was it good spirits or a little bit of sting? It was a little bit of both. I mean, so we actually both. Uh, rode in the same car and it was just us two mm-hmm. normally like there's a third or a fourth person in the car and so we just get in the car and it's silent for a minute <laughs> it's like we we both have the you know whenever you make the cut it's like whenever we've been playing these games as long as we have not that we expect to make the cut but that's when the tournament like actually like feels like it starts mm-hmm. and uh it just got doused so quickly for both of us <laughs> we we're just like that just happened. <laughs> so you mentioned something there too, playing game, playing these kind of games as long as we have. So you have a long history of trading card games. Do you want to just give me a brief summary of that long history? What's uh, yeah. where do you come from? So Zach is three years older than me. Mm-hmm. So whenever I was seven and he was ten, we started playing the Pokemon trading card game. Mm-hmm. You may have heard of it, <clears throat> and uh, we played that a bit. We weren't actually playing it very well but we uh collected the cards and like we approximated play um and we you know grew up a little bit moved on to some other games uh my friends got into magic a little bit i played with them zach played a lot less magic than i ever did yeah um not that i played a ton of it and then we played the star wars tcg the deciphers uh ccg for star wars and lord of the rings the Wizards of the Coast TCG, uh, Netrunner, uh, so many card games. Yeah. Uh, all all through the, the paces until we uh, landed on Flesh and Blood right now. What was it like growing up with uh, a brother that had such similar interests as, as you? I mean, it was, it was awesome, really. Uh, having someone that you could constantly play with, you know, you, you lived with them, you... Uh, could always find a game which is was a rarity back then because online play wasn't really a thing um i'm old enough to remember life before internet yeah um and so like that was awesome that was an awesome part of it and we had a lot of friends that uh were also interested in the game and we ran a lot of the same groups we were both in band Mm -hmm. we both had those friends in common and so uh it was great because whenever his friends would come over it was essentially like my friends were coming over yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's an interesting question for me because I had a brother as well growing up, but 
we were quite different. Um, it's actually funny the way it worked out. He ended up, I would be interested in something, whether it was uh, a sport or a video game or something like that. And then he would come into it about as, uh, as soon as I would leave. Because <laughs> like, uh, I remember probably the best example is I was, we, I played a lot of first person shooting games um, at a decently high level. And I always try to get him into it. And as soon as I quit video games to try to uh, you know build a career and do that stuff, uh, he actually played Overwatch like semi professionally um, hmm. right when it came out. Um, What's the age difference? Four years. Yeah. You said you and Zach are three. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So is that four years? Yeah. He's a bit different yeah. than me though. Um, yeah, he's coming out of college now, which is gonna be it's gonna be weird. So there's a there's another game you didn't t- you didn't. You didn't talk about there. It's, uh, it's called Sky Tear. I heard that there's, uh, well, now a former world champion, but a former world champion, Tim Bunn. What? The background. So just a, like a brief, a quick overview of what Sky Tear is for, any, for anybody who doesn't know. You probably can explain um, it better than I can. So it is a miniatures card game. So you, you build a deck of cards and it's got miniatures with movement and all that kind of things. All those kinds of things. Uh, it's like a MOBA, mm-hmm. uh, like a you know a Dota or a League of Legends. You have lanes you're pushing. You're trying to destroy their nexus or complete some objectives. Um, that's the nuts and bolts of it. Yeah. What was it like? I mean, what is the what was the journey to become the world champion? Um, it's a bit of a smaller game, I know, but still, it's a, it's never it was, easy to be the best. It's fascinating, really. Uh, well, thank you, by the way. Uh, well, it's, that's, we... a, that's a statistic, by the way. It's not an opinion. That's <laughs> <laughs> what world champion um, means. <laughs> so I didn't start playing Sky Tear until after the pandemic had started. Mm-hmm. I played one game before it with Zach and one of my other friends, Eric, who's also a Flesh and Blood player, uh, at least somewhat. <laughs> uh, but we were playing online. So I have a, a, a team that I would test with online. We would meet... Uh, you know, two or three times a week and just jam for three or four hours, depending on the day. Um, and we played a lot of Sky Tear and we uh, made a lot of deck lists. We tested a lot of things. We tried to push it as hard as we could. Um, and then we played in the tournament and then uh, I ended up coming out on top. Yeah. So, uh, Tim actually has a card made in his uh, in his likeness in Sky Tear, which must be pretty cool. It, uh, it is awesome. I actually just picked up my pack that had it. Oh, yeah? Um, and it's just... It it doesn't feel real. It, it's interesting because... So we did all this online. The tournament mm-hmm. was online, um, which was cool because, you know, a lot of people could make it and attend it. You know, normally there's limitations in travel and stuff. Uh, but I was actually sitting in this chair at this computer whenever I won, and I was, I was by myself. So like it was like very, like, huh... This is interesting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, obviously my, my friends were calling me on Discord and stuff and mm-hmm. uh, going crazy in the chat. Uh, and then I went and told my wife and then Zach and his wife came over and we had dinner celebrating. Oh, yeah. Picked up the Lambo the day after. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I think I could reasonably say that you like to play competitively. Um, and after knowing you throughout the competitive season, I know that you have some aspirations in flesh and blood. How did that start? And where, where is it now? Because um, I know a lot of us start or started flesh and blood. It's like, eh, I just want to be a little bit better than all the people around me. Or it's like, I like to win. I don't like that you lose. That's how it starts. But then you, you play more. You go to events and you move that goalpost a little bit farther. Um, or back a little bit for some people. What do you think in your future is in uh, in competitive? What are you What are you trying to achieve? Because you played a a few events um, last season for the Collings. I did play a few events. Um, so at this point in my life, like I said, I've played a lot of card games. I've played competitively in most of them. Um, I I sort of have two modes with a card game, and it's either I play this once every six months or I'm obsessed with it. Yeah. Um, and 
the reality is any card game I play that I'm obsessed about and I want to compete at, my goal is the top. Like, I ideally I'm I add another world championship to my title. Mm. You know, this, this whenever that actually happens. So the tippy top. That's the goal. Um, I'm also a realist, and I know that the math says the majority of flesh and blood players will not be the world champion this year. Sure, but, but there's a. I think that there is a. Um... There's a lot of variables that go into that equation, right? And you have a lot of agency. Oh, you have a lot of agency over those. So how far are you willing to push that in order to achieve that goal? Like, are you going to be going to all the events? Um, like, how do you envision getting there, right? Because a lot of people want to be the world champion, but it's all the, it's all the time in between that makes you the world champion, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that there's a, a great quote that basically, I'm going to butcher it, but it's essentially that uh, luck is when talent meets preparation. Mm -hmm. And I think that in order to win a world championship or a national championship or even, you know, a tournament, there's a number of factors that have to go your way. Uh, But maximizing your odds in each of those things is how you get there. Um, And so I'm playing almost every day, at least for a couple of hours, uh, grinding games. I plan on going to as many events as is reasonable mm-hmm. with time and money and work and all of that. Um, and I'm, I mean, I want it. <laughs> I like that word though, reasonable. What does that mean? Time, work, money, these limitations. How do we like... What is the true limiter, right? Because a lot of that, you know, we can have this sort of soft limitation and then we flex it a little bit as we, I don't know, push harder or figure out that it's going to require more work than we expected. So what does reasonable look like for you? Could you be hitting every event uh, in 2022 in preparation? Like what will you sacrifice? So, I mean, my family is (laughs) is the line probably. Yeah. My wife probably wouldn't appreciate me losing my job because I took too many days off to go to all of these events. Mm-hmm. Um, unless I start winning some money. <laughs> but that's a whole other conversation. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think that's ultimately where it is. I <clears throat> am trying to go as many as is reasonable for work and, and finances mm-hmm. while maintaining our house and our you know livelihood. Yeah. It's a, uh, so you, like you said, you played a little bit of magic before we know the magic pro tour, how that kind of worked. There was, um, a somewhat sustainable system for professional players to play those events frequently, um, and consistently that seems like it's not going to be implemented in flesh and blood. So are you aware, like, I'm not too aware, but from what I understand, there was, you know, appearance fees like it was pretty easy to well and then also you know stipends to travel accommodation things like that looks like we won't have that in flesh and blood or at least it definitely hasn't been announced yet so at least not in the same way yeah not in the same way um with a new announcement on the pro tour about the ptis and gifting them (laughs) (laughs) oh don't worry we'll get to that one um that's actually so funny we talked about that on the podcast last week and you know, it's just one of those things, right? It's one of those issues where um, people are very opinionated. The sides are a little bit tribal at this point, And I didn't know how it was going to go because I feel like Hayden and I, and even you, if you played back in skirmish season, have some pretty objective data on how that thing goes down, especially in regards to experience. And then also, I mean, I don't know how... <laughs> Like the idea of gifting is also not the idea of selling, but yeah, I feel like there's some pretty objective data that Hayden and I had been exposed to that a lot of other newer players hadn't because that was very much a thing of the past, either 1k XP, skirmish, some road to nationals, um, XP grinds. And yeah, I was, I was surprised to have decently good feedback. Maybe we weren't polarizing enough on the issue, but I was actually expect, <laughs> expecting to get lit up for that one because like there's a really good count, like the other side has like, um, I say like there's two sides, but it's not really two sides, right? We're all trying to collectively have a better player experience. But I know people who are against this XP system, 
um, or at least criticized it or accused of something of, of accused of entitlement, which is probably, I mean, it's, it's true on some basis where if someone doesn't, doesn't think it's a good system because they got a PTI through the system that was set, like they were said, okay, you have to, you have to get a top eight here. You have to do whatever to get the PTI. And that's what they were like emotionally attached to. And now LSS has come out and been like, you know, it's, it's, it's also XP and they feel like they kind of got robbed. Like, yeah, that, that's definitely like almost strictly the definition of entitlement, whether it's like, you know, completely wrong. I'm not going to get into, but like our argument is not even around entitlement. It's that this system doesn't actually hurt pro players. It only hurts casual players because like as a, as a super, as a super casual player, you might think like, okay, now I can just play events and then I'll get, I'll get, I might get an invite to the pro tour if I work really hard. But the way it really works out is like, <laughs> in our example, is it, it isn't Andy Armory that gets, that gets the invite. It's, no. uh, it's Dylan, it's Dylan D bag. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's the dude, who, it, it's the people who, who like really exploit it, push it and grind really hard. Obviously it's limited on like some sort of number where, you know, if the number's large enough, you're going to get a, you know, Num- invites so you're going to get some people who get it organically who get it by playing by the rules and just being active in the community but those people who are you know going to lock in those like first second third fourth fifth invites like they're going to play in a way that's just not or they're going to u- play the system in a way that's not even remotely accessible to a casual player like it's it's more expensive than callings um it's you know it's it requires for some people to not have a job, right? Like if you're grinding the online stuff, also online mm-hmm. stuff. So part of it does not actually support your local, your local scene. Um, and then like, yeah, it could lead to some nasty social interactions where <clears throat> not terribly bad, but you know, you could have a lot of spiking at casual events. Like <laughs> they, it's way more important, right? There's a lot on the line. Yeah. It's a pro tour invite on the line. And now you have to, you go to an army and there's like this weird plus EV where you're like, okay, I traveled 30 minutes here. I paid $40. I got 30 minutes to go back. I'm here for four hours. How much XP do I get to have like a plus estimated value on this? And like, it's not great. And then it probably trickles down to a bad, a bad, um, sometimes a bad experience for people who are there just to have fun. Yeah. I mean, I absolutely think that's going to happen with the system. Uh, to some extent, how how bad it is, you know, it just depends. Yeah. Um, My caveat is I think that the extent of how bad it is is usually not as bad as we think it will be. Because um, I, the 1K XP stuff, that was definitely bad. Um, like that was, I mean, to, <laughs> to, to be able to get 1K XP usually wasn't like super organic. It was very planned and you had to kind of work the system mm-hmm. a bit. Um, even Don, Dante Telvico will come on here and tell you how what he did to do it. And like it's it's a lot of armories. Um, but I remember with Road to Nationals, I was actually, I was, or sorry, with Nationals, a little bit, I was a little bit concerned because like, wow, we had the system and it really sucked for the 1K XP stuff. But the invite list was so large for Road to Nats um, that it actually ended up being cool. Like it worked out really well. Yeah. Um, for the pro tour, I think that the invites will be <laughs> significantly reduced, and the stakes are a lot higher because we're talking about um, what is it, two hundred thousand dollars is the tournament prize? Hundred thousand, I think. Or is that two hundred? I don't know. I don't remember. Yeah, it's an interesting um, state in flesh and blood. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, ultimately, I'm fine with the gifting. It doesn't. That's less. It's it's fine. I mean, um, it's just like I. I just wish we didn't call it gifting because it, it feels yeah. that feels like if if you're just gonna say it's gifting, um, yeah, the, maybe that's the, the only is, thing you can't. The word is wrong. Yeah, yeah, because it, feel, it feels like that, they're out of touch, right? It's like that's not what's gonna happen. Yeah. I mean, it I, might, mean I think that that will happen to some extent. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, but but really, it's people are gonna sell them. They could have just said you can transfer them to other people. I mean, yeah. there's, there's gifting does have a certain connotation to it. Um, I did so on Twitter. Uh, D Rude, the guy from Harry Tarantula, Tarantula. yeah, uh, he made a, a point that I liked a lot. Is that ultimately uh, LSS is giving these people that are able to stack up invites a like unofficial way to turn that into some cash to supplement their travel and all of that stuff. For sure. Which I it well, after he though. said that it, it, I mean that's the question, right? It's a way for them to get around having to do it themselves, which is interesting. Um, but what does it do, right? Does it kind of like, uh, I don't know, um, 
ruin this like the like, i don't know the idea of a pro tour right like it, it, it kind definitely of, it under, makes it less romantic yeah like the underlying you know, integrity is kind of jeopardized absolutely so like the the pro tour in quotation marks you want it to be a situation where it's the best of the best and they're duking it out uh you know they all earn their spot here and it's it's you know it's it's a very romanticized idea i think uh the reality is again selling pro tour invites probably just helps the professional player like the the person that's taking it serious which is funny again it, it like it doesn't hurt the pro players it just hurts like the casual scene kind of again um to an extent but yeah. in in theory it makes the tournament softer right um i also think that there are going to be examples of people that worked their you know their rear ends off and played really well consistently that just never got to a top eight or a yeah. you know a battle hardened that like arguably deserve to be in the, the pro tour or you, you know uh, it, yeah the deserves a hard word um yeah. it's like a really hard word because yeah i mean that's i think that's like uh the under a lot of underlying frustration is probably around what what does and does not deserve to be on the pro tour right like we it's undeniable that um the parameters in which we thought that this was achievable the rules of the game have changed right we were we thought that we had you know the directions um and we we assigned some sort of emotional attachment to that now it's just kind of been flipped on its head right and part of that is we assumed as a collective that rated rated experience and things like that would be used um but Again, and I still think it will. Yeah, it will for sure. I I do too, right? There has to be some use case for that. Um, I would like to acknowledge that, like, rated Elo is not immediately a great solution, right? Because there were some, like, I mean, particularly Europe, they had a calling and it just got canceled, right? So some areas are quite underserved for that, and it's not very fair. Um, so, absolutely. Right? So so my thought process. I, I totally agree, 100%. It's not fair. It's not balanced. Neither is Lifetime XP. Yeah, I know. That's the same thing, right? Like, like if you... Yeah. You also can't play Armories if you're in that... If usually in the yeah. same scenario, yeah. It's um, weird. And so, like, to me, we have the system in place. We have rated players through ELO. Why aren't you just using that in addition to? Yep. Like, it's there. A lot of the people that are on the top 100 of ELO already have invites or will get them through ProQuest, I assume uh, a good chunk of them will. It's not like it's adding that many more players to the Pro Tour and you're actually using this thing that you touted as the premier measure of a professional flesh and blood player. My favorite solution, um, and Hayden, I remember he said that he took this from somebody and he, he gave them credit in the pod and I totally don't know their name at this point, <laughs> but he said, okay, well, if we don't want to use Red Elo, um, why not just expand the ProQuest invites, right? Like now it's at one. Why not mm-hmm. top four? Yeah. I mean, when I heard that, I was like, why not? <laughs> well, that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> what the heck? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's this idea, like there's definitely, there's an idea that this, I saw like, yeah, one of the, one of the ideas is like, this is going to funnel more sales to local game stores. And like, this is LSS's way of kind of, pumping liquidity into like stores hands right is heavily incentivizing players to um play armories and i think that incentivizing players to play armories is part of their job as as the company Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean you have to incent like the incentivization doesn't have to be pro tour invites i don't know it's just like i i agree that it's important and i agree that it's we we want local game stores to make money but creating this system which allows for a lot of exploitation outside of giving local game stores money. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, probably not the best thing. I think we could we could funnel we could uh, we could funnel more money to to LGSs in a di- in a different way through different systems and through different I mean, rewards. You can use the same system and just say at the end of this time period, the top one hundred get a promo. Yeah, yeah, an exclusive promo. I mean. <laughs> It's it's funny, um, but did you before we went uh, before this announcement? Did you get a PTI in the in the season? I did not. Okay, so 
did you meet this news with happiness or disappointment? Because even if you acknowledge that there's an underlying uh, flaw to this, were you happy because now you're live, right? Like now you're, you're, you're probably going to go. So, I mean, hypothetically, yes, but the reality is looking at the system, I see the flaws in it and I know that I'm not going to play 10 armories a week. I'm, I know that I'm not high enough on the global XP because I haven't been spending time at armories. Mm-hmm. Um, especially because they made the announcement for using 90 day XP whenever there was like 40 days until the cutoff or yeah. whatever it was. There's, li- um, so there's some lifetime as well, right? Like there's some from the lifetime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. lifetime. I, I'm not even close on lifetime. <laughs> yeah. I didn't start playing until March of last year. And then all of that was during pandemic whenever people weren't doing events. Most people on top of lifetime are either from APAC or they play online. Yep. It, yeah. It, I, it, I saw that. <laughs> almost like period. Like that's yeah. just a fact. And APAC is not even really up there. It's mostly just people who play online. <laughs> yeah. Um. And most of my time has been been spent playing online with people I know personally, not mm-hmm. in armories. Um, because I also was told, hypothetically, even if it wasn't directly, that you know XP isn't how you're going to be the the top player. Like that's not the point. the The rating is so. It's like okay, I'm not going to worry about XP right now. Um, I'm just going to wor- worry about getting better at the game. Yep. I think at this point, it is what it is. Uh, Like, Legend Story has shown that they're willing to listen, and I think there has been a lot of good feedback on this. And also, that feedback is not completely opinion-based. Like, some of it is rooted in, like, very clear past examples. Um, And obviously, we'll see how this plays out. Uh, So, I mean, I plan on going to Jersey either way, so it'll be fine. I'm ultimately always optimistic even naively optimistic potentially on pretty much everything that lss does because i believe in the leadership over there and i believe in the company um so every time we hit any sort of bump in the road i always i'm always on the side that assumes that eventually it all leads to correction like my view on flesh and blood legend story is always like a, a long view right it's yeah. always the five to ten year I agree time completely. Horizon. yeah it's one of the reasons why i bought in is i saw the at worst the vision it's like I, I can tell that he really cares about this and has an idea of where he wants it to go yeah um and so i i, be, I believe in the company getting there do you have any plans to travel to new zealand to play oh, I, I mean as soon as i know the dates and can work it out it. i want to it's incredible um it's really funny that I think a lot of people are going to go through this experience. Um, and this is just a little anecdotal from my side. But, you know, Wizards of the Coast being in, like, Seattle or something like that, you know, traveling, have events there, or they might have something cool in, you know, Japan, Europe, wherever it is. But we're get, we're definitely going to have some big tournament <laughs> or series of tournaments in New Zealand, Australia. Yeah, do you and think I'm, there's not going to be a pro tour in New Zealand? Yeah. Come on. I'm so excited for everybody to be able to explore that country because it is absolutely beautiful. Um, And I know for me, it's not that I would have never gone, but it would have been a long time, um, I think, because that is very much a far off destination. Uh, And yeah, I was, I'm very happy that I, (laughs) I had the sort of privilege to go there and the opportunity as well. And I think that a lot of people are going to be able to experience that as well. And they don't appreciate how incredible that trip is going to be because it's yeah, freaking I, awesome. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree completely. I haven't been, and I agree. Um, <laughs> forever, New Zealand's been on like the top of my like. This is a dream vacation of mine is to go to there one day. Yeah. Um, it everything about it just seems gorgeous, and I'm really excited to go and play a game with people and uh, have a lot of fun. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be super cool having like a all the people that we've been traveling to these U.S. callings with and road to nationals and all that stuff over on the other side of the world. That's going to be fun. I'm really excited for, like, when we go to, like, Japan, Europe. Um, 
like Utrecht was a little bit out of the way and it was a little bit too close to the other callings for it to be reasonable for me. Also, it was just Utrecht where I think that if they have like a month where they have you know, two of them in the same month, three of them in the same month, it makes a lot more sense to kind of go over there and try to do something longer. But yeah, I'm really excited for, for international travel. I mean, the U.S. travels aren't even so cool. Like Cincinnati, yeah. Vegas, Dallas. It was really fun. Yeah, absolutely. This past year is one of my favorite years of gaming. Uh, <laughs> it's been a ton of fun going to these callings. I've never done this much traveling for a game before. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> Let's go. So what are your thoughts on Everfest so far? Um, we're recording this. What is it? It's the 7th of February. So that's been out for a little yeah. bit. Um, uh, may have cards in hand. What do you think? I do a whole stack of them. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I have likes and dislikes of the set. Um, I think that the meta is getting a lot of really interesting tools, especially following the errata and the ban mm-hmm. uh, that just recently happened. I think that it is uh, way more wide open than it's ever been. Um, now that Chain the Boogeyman is gone and Briar the Boogie Woman are gone. At are, least, are at least, that? as boogeymen and boogie women, they are. Are they though? Uh, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> uh, I think that they're both very good decks, very playable still. Uh, but before, it felt like they were obviously on a a, a tier above. Um, and then now, I think with these changes and this set, there are a lot more heroes that are on that level. Um. I could see someone doing well with Prism, Dash, Bravo, Oldham, Bravo, Viscerae. Like, it's just, the list is crazy. Whenever you think about it, we only have 15, 16 heroes now. Yeah. Um, I have a fun yeah. question. What's, huh? what, uh, fun question. What is going to have a bigger impact on the meta? Class Constructed Meta and Flesh and Blood. Every single card in Everfest... Or Briar's Errata. And Plunder Run's ban. <laughs> okay. I was like, eh, probably Plunder Run's ban, I think. Yeah. Um, Which is funny. <laughs> I think so, too. <laughs> and it's pr- probably why they banned it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, on the surface, Plunder Run seems like a perfectly fair card. Uh, it replaces itself, and it does three damage. It, if it hits, it's like, and it's from Arsenal. It's a lot of conditionals. Um, but it just is too efficient at what it does and it was just warping it the meta a bit um even if we didn't see it directly um and i think changing that makes it a lot easier to deal with those strategies i think it allows for everything in between aggro and control to exist where it's either well i wouldn't even call it aggro because it's been the hyper aggro deck that deck and if you're not on that deck why are you playing an aggro deck um or the complete opposite side, which was like fatigue and dirtle, and that's literally feels like it's been our entire meta. There's been there was one big outlier, which was Viscerai. Viscerai is definitely a, a mid range kind of combo deck, and that thrived in that format. Um, but I think that's also because Viscerai is a rune blade. Rune blades are pretty good. So They're not bad. <laughs> um, how much of rune blades uh, dominance, if you will? Uh, do you think lies in their equipment options? I had this exact Hayden and I had this exact question for the, like our command and cookout section for uh, <laughs> like a couple weeks ago. Um, oh. How much is required? So a good amount, but I think that previously most of their dominance has actually come from the words that were printed on their heroes. Sure. Um, but other than that, like I think that Rosetta Thorn is incredibly good. I think that uh, Spellbound Creepers is incredibly good, and Bloodshe Scalata is incredibly good. Like, I think some of those are bet. What? What, that? what about that? Their grasp. The grasp is. I mean, it's not bad, but it, it's. I don't feel like it's warping. Where I, I feel like those cards are like they warp sure. the decks and the metas around them. It's a two defense battle worn. Yeah. The... Yeah, it's definitely good, right? But like Spellbound Creepers has the potential to just be broken um it's yep. already very good and then rosetta thorn is i mean yeah that 
that's like the one of the best weapons ever printed it's, i think it's nuts yeah it's when so you good. compare it to the other weapons it's like what is happening here <laughs> yeah i mean it kind of makes sense and then yeah it's just it's so powerful and efficient especially in those like aggra- more aggressive style decks um but yeah i think a significant amount um is attributed to their armor suite uh, they also have a pretty decent card pool which helps um and split damage like split damage i assume was a a delicate part of the game right because we have full arcane kano and then we have physical and then we have this uh in between and i think that is going to always have the potential to be extremely powerful because it requires your opponent to kind of deal with you on two completely different axes it just forces them to be inefficient yeah and it's very inefficient to block it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's I, I'm really interested in Viscerai coming in. So Viscerai, not traditionally great in the prism, but I mean, other than the very aggressive uh, Viscerai decks and you know some of the some of the mid range tools, like it didn't get hit. It only got it only got <laughs> it only got more tools in the toolbox, and they're pretty good ones yeah. too. Swarming Gloomvale. A Revel in Runeblood, um, mm-hmm. you name Runer it. Runeblood Reclamation, I think, is great in the Prism matchup. Yeah, for sure. Is it good enough, though? <laughs> That's the question. Uh, it's the so, question a lot of people are asking right now about, is it good enough to beat Prism? Yeah, I think that the, <clears throat> the community collectively believes that Prism is going to be the dominant deck going into week one of the Pro Quest. What do you think? I mean, so that's always a funny question, right? I mean, it's the whole metagame if everyone thinks that then everyone should be be playing it or playing the thing that beats it right mm-hmm. uh, what, but what beats it, it though? that's the, the question right uh but if you ask everyone what their like second choice for the meta would be it's probably going to be either this array or a guardian and it's like if if a is true which is prism is the meta I think that Guardian and Viscerae are questionable. Mm-hmm. Like, I've watched those Guardian matches, and they are not fun. Like, yeah. It's rough. Yeah, Guardian um, to Prism. Not yeah, Guardian to Prism. Uh, and then the Viscerae into Prism, I mean, it, it's 50-50 at best. Like, I mean, close. it's close to fair at best. I think it's uh, actually... Get people a little spice. They sit through time around. I think it's actually very winnable on the on the Viscerai side, but I still don't think is yeah. not not the word I want whenever I am trying to decide on my deck. I don't want a deck that has matchups that are winnable. I think it would be too much for me to say favorable at this point because I haven't tested it enough. Right? I need yeah. to test it more before I can say that word favorable. It's a pretty powerful F word that one, and people will, yeah. they'll hold me to it. You know, <laughs> I think Absolutely. week week one is going to be a lot of prism. Um, I think so too. Is it going to be a lot of prisms winning? I think so. I think yes. Um, to be honest, because if we even look at, like, if we look at uh, week weekend one of the last pro quest, there was a lot of Bravo, um, and I felt I feel like Chain kind of dunked on Bravo in that format, and yeah, like you saw Bravo fade out um, in a lot of Bolton. You saw that kind of fade out as well. And a lot of Prism. Prism persisted despite its absolutely abysmal statistical representation in the top eight and wins. People think that I hate Prism because I quote cool statistics. Um, but again, <laughs> it, it, it did it did get the last laugh because it won the Calling Vegas. But yeah, I think we're going to see like the week one meta of ProQuest, at least at this point in the game, with these this current amount of players... I think that's pretty predictable, right? Whatever kind of looks to be like the best deck, you know, you can pick it up. It feels pretty intuitive to kind of dominate people with it. That's the deck that's it's pretty highly represented on that week one. And then we start to see the correction in like a week three. We don't really see it week two, but more like a week three, week four. We start to see it evolve. What deck are you bringing to your first pro quest in? Um, I have not decided officially yet, but I'm flopping between three. Okay. Uh, Prism, Katsu, and Briar. Tell me... So if it was tomorrow, what do you bring? You have to pick one. If it's tomorrow, I'm bringing Briar. Mm. What version of Briar? Earthbriar? Yeah, Earthbriar. 
Yeah. Earth Briar Rex Prism. <laughs> that's the that's the hope. <laughs> but the current or strategies might change that. So we'll see. Yeah. yeah. I need a lot of, a lot of testing. If if people uh, think that uh if, if people think that Lightning Briar was good into in, good into Prism, you should have seen Earth Briar. <laughs> it was disgusting. Abysmal. Oh my <laughs> god. Yeah. It's it's probably one of the best decks into Prism for sure. Like the Blade Billy better than Rhinar. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. <laughs> it's it's nuts how good it is. Yeah. Um and I think that it can do the job, you know, it can get there. It has decent matchups against everything else, I think. Because it can actually punch through a Guardian. But that's a lot of prism. <laughs> yeah. All right. So one final question. Just like, what is your, what's your favorite class? What do you enjoy playing? What do you wish was the, you could just play in Class Constructed? So my two favorite classes from the beginning were Ninja and Wizard. Mm-hmm. Um, I've played a lot of both. I think Wizard struggles in CC in general, and I would love to see uh, a meta where I feel like I can take Wizard and feel confident in my choice. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that there have been metas that were, you know, close for Katsu. Maybe not a hundred percent the right choice, but like you, you could justify it if you really wanted to. Yeah, um, Monarch. Yeah, so I I definitely think that Wizard's probably the class I would want to see get the most love to just push over that hump a little bit. Yeah, well, everybody knows that I agree with you. <laughs> I've been a little bit vocal about my uh, my love for Wizard. That being said, I think that if Wizard was by far the most dominant deck in the game, that it would actually warp the game completely I, because it's I agree. so atypical. Yeah. I don't think a, it's a good thing for the game either, yeah. if it's the deck. Um, but I would like it at least to be... I could feel comfortable with it at a, at a big event. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think that we're there yet. Maybe we These are. These new cards... Uh, I don't think we were there yet. <laughs> These new cards, maybe it can be. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's just up in the air still. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? That does answer my question. <laughs> All right, Tim. Thank you so much for joining me on Time in the Round. Do you have anything that you want to shill or plug? Uh, no, not 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 particularly. <laughs> um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can. I've been tweeting a lot more about Flesh and Blood recently. Uh, it's a good time. It's at Tim Bun. Fellow Twitter Spaces host um, last week or two weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah, I will say in closing, this is your first time, I think, you know, on time or on Arsenal Pass. If anybody disagreed with uh, uh, my opinion on the XP system for the Pro Tour, just go blow up Tim. Just you know, go crazy. He's please, he can take. Please it. do. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, Tim. Thanks so much for joining me. Uh, I'm super excited to play with you in 2022. I know we're going to be doing a lot of traveling together. Um, yeah, man. Thanks again. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a great time, and this community is great. Awesome. Well, we hope you enjoyed watching. Until next time, we'll see you in the next video.